Adrian Burton has asked to do a presentation to you on his findings. He's done a huge amount of research and investigation into this matter, and it's now his opportunity to present to you his findings um, prior to then uh, Michael coming up with his first draft of his review. So, Adrian, if you want to come up, I'll just get your slides up. Well, to start at the beginning, I thought to call it the Crozier Hill Land Divisions was a bit mundane, so I decided to call it consideration of a community issue from a personal perspective, which is another way of saying a person, giving a personal perspective about a community issue, because I believe this is a community issue. All material presented is my personal opinion and is offered on the basis of it being without prejudice. I trust everyone, and perhaps especially Michael Osborne, who is a qualified and experienced professional, accepts that the views stated are those of a lay person with no training or experience in planning, surveying or legal matters, who is offering material in good faith and with positive intent. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to present information that's been provided by Victoria. Thank you, Victoria. I appreciate the support I've received over the years to swim against the tide. And I appreciate the cooperation of Ben Blatchford and Lance Labrandi, who have allowed me to use their photographs because I believe they tell their own story. The basic aim of my presentation is to suggest that, along with all residents and ratepayers of Victor, the main aim of my presentation is to suggest that, along with all residents and ratepayers of Victor and the surrounding districts, we've all been adversely affected in some way by the Stock Road saga. To misquote deliberately the words of a song, I am one, but we are many. I am, you are, we are all affected. I believe it's entirely fitting that a community issue be discussed in our community chamber. This presentation expresses personal disappointment concerning the processes involved during and after the Crozier Hill land divisions. The wider implication is that, in one sense, all residents and ratepayers may have been disadvantaged by action taken or approved by our council. It is alleged that about two thirds of an estimated total area of 12 hectares, which is approximately 30 acres of exquisite and irreplaceable floodplain land that was intended to be entrusted to our council has been subdivided and sold for private profit. A page three article in the Advertiser dated the 29th of August 2018, which is not very long ago, states that cruise ship passengers would dock at Granite Island under an ambitious plan to bring thousands of tourists to the jewel of the Flurio Peninsula. Most regrettably, an ideal area with the potential to become a tourist eco, I beg your pardon, an ecotourism feature has been lost to the community. The model says what, then so what, and now what? 
I'm not going to concentrate on the whole model. I'm simply going to look at what. What has happened? There are consequences for what have happened, yes. There's a plan of action, yes. But that's not what I'm going to look at. An early and important aspect of bridge building might be to assist the community to become fully aware of what has happened. The unique features of the proposed Crozier Hill Land Division were addressed by the special creation of the Rural Living 4 zone within the Council Development Plan. Council have known all along that there's a danger of flooding and they wrote into the development plan special provisions. The land division was approved by full council in March of the year 2000. That was in the days before council development assessment panels, which had three councillors and three independent experts, planners, and that's now been changed again. But when this was enacted, it was voted on by the entire council. The rezoning of the land created about 40 rural living allotments occupying an area of 59.8 hectares. That's about 150 acres. So it was a major development. A plan was agreed to protect the environment, to provide safety for residents and to protect assets. The plan had four main features. Firstly, define the extent of the floodplain. Pretty sensible, you can't do much until you've defined the extent, until you know where the land is in or out of the floodplain. The second feature was that there was to be no development with the defined, within the defined 100 ARI floodline. ARI means or stands for average recurrence interval. Land outside the floodline was to be made available for sale, provided it complied with certain conditions, but land inside the floodline was to be set aside as a reserve under the control of council. All land inside the floodline. And those principles were written into the Development Act as principles of development. Now we're going to do a bit of theory, I'm afraid. Within the relevant development plan, the concept, match, concept map identified as figure RUL4, Victor Harbour afterwards, is critically important. The identification of the map refers to rural living four zone in Victor Harbour and is usually simply called figure four. I'll just refer to it as figure four, everyone does. The first principle of the general principles of development control state, development should be in accordance with figure four. Figure four is fundamental in its own right and also plays an important role in the principles of development control numbers seven and nine. Now, when you first look at figure four, it looks deceptively bare, but it's the absolute foundation upon which the development plan for the Rural Living 4 zone is built. It clarifies a simple and basic concept. All land within the floodline, the defined extent of the flood plain, is to be part of a reserve. If figure four could speak, 
I believe it would say something like, you know, it's not my job to know exactly where the defined boundary of the floodplain may be, but I do know that wherever it may be, all land within it shall be part of a reserve, as my diagram so clearly shows. If you look at the shaded area, it's got a dotted boundary around the outside. All land inside that dotted boundary is to be reserved. There are two additional principles that further clarify the control of development in the rural living for zone. Notice the terminology, the control of development. Development control, that's exactly what we're speaking about and that's exactly what these principles say. Land Division Principle 7 states, land should generally be divided in accordance with Figure 4 and having regard to a hydrological assessment defining the extent of the 1 in 100 ARI flood. This is important because it says that the, the figure 4 is to be used with the hydrological assessment. One cannot take the place of the other. They both need to exist together and they both need to exist harmoniously together. The stated requirement that you can see there is to provide an assessment defining the extent. That's the wording, defining the extent which is quite different to providing information on the approximate extent. Very different meaning, and I'll point that out. That's an important clarification. The next, the next principle, principle nine, says any division of land abutting the Inman River should result in the vesting of the river alignment and its floodplain as depicted on figure four as part of open space contribution within the relevant authority. Very sensible, a bit official, but it simply says all land which is inside the flood line is to be vested, controlled by, looked after by council because the relevant authority is the local council. Now that's, that's the end of the hard part. Just to summarise, there are three principles that we've got to come back to all the time. Principle one, development is to be in accordance with figure four. Amen, full stop, the end. Development is to be in accordance with figure four. Second principle, land is to be divided in accordance with figure four and a hydrological assessment that defines the boundaries or the borders of a 100-year flood. Principle 9, all floodplain land next to the Inman River should be part of a reserve entrusted to the local council. Now, each of those principles sits on the foundation of figure 4. I'm a layperson, and this is a layperson's way of looking at it. I think there are two simple questions. Has a surveyed hydrological assessment that defines the extent of a one in a hundred year flood been lodged prior to assessment? Yes or no? And the second one, is all land contained within the defined extent of the floodplain shown to be part of a reserve that has been entrusted to the local council? Very simple, yes or no? Now what I'm going to do is go through four main maps 
and they show four stages in the development of the um, Crozier Hill Estate. The first map is an approximate hand-drawn map. This is often referred to as the first Tonkin map. It's got a number 99.0389. The second map is a plan of division for development. That's the map that was submitted to council for approval. The third map is a surveyed hydrological assessment. Confusing, it's rather confusing because it starts off with three nines as well. There's a 99 and a 999, but they're quite different maps. And of course the last is the deposited plan approval. What was finally approved uh, by the Lands Department? And the question is, is there evidence available that any of the relevant maps depict a situation that was consistent with figure four and was consistent with the principles seven and nine. Principle one of the general principle of development control for the rural living four zone of the council development plan states development should be in accordance with figure four. The total length of the whole land division from Glenvale Road to Swain Crossing Road is approximately one and a half kilometres. And as I said before, that totals an area of 59.8 hectares. The contour lines identify a potential issue that could impact on the floodplain as they show there is a 100 metre difference in level, which is approximately 10 houses high spread over a distance of about 500 metres. Now, as you know, the greater the slope, the faster water will flow. And as you also know, the faster water flows, the more damage it does. There is an extensive catchment area that feeds the flood plain. You can see the hills there on two sides, actually, it slopes. It's a great way of gathering water, flood water. Our community was alerted to the potential impact of a flood on the 14th of September 2016. That's almost exactly two years ago, within, within a few weeks, exactly two years ago. couple of photographs on that day, the 14th of September 2016, on Swain Crossing Road. A series of nine recommendations concerning the Stock Road saga, including considering whether the upgrading of Swain Crossing Road could significantly reduce flood risk, were not considered when presented at the February 2017 Council meeting and are not believed to have ever been considered since. They've just gone into limbo. To return the focus of figure four, because this is the foundation. I've got to admit, for a long time, I was more bothered about what it didn't show than what it did show. I used to say to myself, why, why, is it, why is it not defining the extent? Of course, it was produced well before. But what it does do, it does beautifully. Figure four may have depicted a simple concept that all land within the 100-year floodline is to be retained as a reserve but was it applied? It's all well and good to have it written down. Was the main concept put into operation? Was it supervised? Were implications concerning the application or possible lack thereof reported? And to whom?
This is a handmade model trying to show the potential impact of a hypothetical subdivision involving land on a floodplain. The bold red line you can see there represents a um, represents the extent of the floodplain. It's the, the border of the flood line. All land to the north of it is outside the flood line and all land south of it is inside. And I've made four little lots. The issues concerning any proposed subdivision might include has the extent of the one in a hundred year floodplain been defined by a surveyed hydrological assessment? The answer for our model is yes it has. Is all land within the defined extent of the floodplain contained within the reserve? I've gone out of my way to show that number one lot, the answer is definitely no. But it is yes for lots two and three. Then I've asked, could a fair and reasonable degree of flexibility, a bit of give and take or fair exchange, account for any variance to council policy? The degree of variance turns out to be important when you are actually looking at development applications. So on lot four, I tried to show a little bit of land, give or take, might be acceptable. Would the proposed subdivision enable all of the floodplain to be vested to the relevant authority? Again, the answer is definitely no for lot one and yes for lots two and three. So now we start to look at the actual maps. I'm losing my trousers, sorry. Whoops. That's it. The three handwritten notes these were written by uh, Ken Schalk, the guy who, who drew up the map, not me. Inside the red boxes at the foot of the map are typed in the three boxes down the right-hand side. The engineering data for the map was prepared by BC Tonkin and Associates, who were engaged by the developer. And the map was drawn by DC, DSC Andrews surveyors. Mr. Bob Andrews from that company acted as consultant for the developer, Mr. Mark Stock. I stress that all of the maps I'm showing have been drawn up by the developer, not by me. These are not my maps. We have been told this map, and I quote, defined the extent of the 100-year ARI flood and was used in the assessment of the land division. Now, I believe available evidence shows the map does not define the extent of the floodplain, nor does it claim to have done so. We are not told how or why the map was used in the assessment or what specific role the map played in the assessment. How could that map have defined the extent of the 100-year floodplain when it's clearly marked approximate extent 100-year ARI floodplain? How can a map at the same time be both approximate and definitive? Surely the concept of a defined approximation is contradictory. If something is defined, it cannot be approximate. Or if it's approximate, it can't be defined. They're mutually exclusive. How can a map which says approximate 
be taken to be a, defi a, a, a defining statement. Furthermore, if, map, if the first Tonkin map did define the flood, flood plain, why was it necessary to undertake a second hydrological report? Because they come in at about 20 or 30 grand a pop. So if it was already done, why was it necessary to do it again? And furthermore, why did the outcome, which is map 999254, provide a significantly different result when the same people did the two maps? The same companies did the two maps. If the first Tonkin map was used during the assessment, to what extent was it consistent with council policy? If you've got a map that's going to be used as part of the assessment process, it should comply with council policy. Was the map consistent with figure four? No. Was it consistent with development control principle one? No. Did it provide a hydrological appraisal defining the extent of the floodplain? No. Was it consistent with land division principle seven? No. Would all floodplain land have been vested to council? No. Was it consistent with land division principle nine? No. But it was used during assessment. The red outline indicates three of the boundaries of both the Rural Living Four Zone and the Crozier Hill Land Division. The fourth side is formed by Swain Crossing Road. Now, <coughs> you'll note that Swain Crossing Road there runs vertical and later on it'll run at an angle and that, that means the, the curvature will appear a bit different of the, of the defined flood line. The yellow area represents floodplain land that should be part of a reserve. I was trying to be smart and use the red pointer but I'll give up. The yellow area is inside the defined or the approximate flood line. but it's not part of the reserve. It's part of private property, or it was sold for, for uh, you know, by, by a person purchasing. It wasn't kept as reserve, that's what I'm trying to say. The green area represents the area of land that was retained as the reserve. Now that's uh, an enlarged version and it might make it a bit uh, simpler. The question down the side is, could the initial handwritten map indicate an intention to undertake a course of action contrary to council policy? Because right at the start, right at the very, very beginning it doesn't comply. I don't think there was ever in, any intention for it ever to uh, comply. Now, this is an important principle is the extent of the reserve shown as being defined by the boundaries of the allotments rather than the extent of the floodplain? Yes, it is. You wouldn't believe it. What is meant to define 
the boundary of the floodplain is meant to be this magical line that, that defines the extent of the floodplain. It, it curves, it follows the contours of the, of the land. But what we've got into now, it's no longer the defining line, flood line, that determines the extent of the reserve. The reserve now is defined by allotment boundaries, some of which are in the floodplain. Now that is quite contrary to the intent of figure four and the wording of principle seven. We'll just quickly have a look at the possibility of swapping portion A with portion B. They're about the same size. Some's inside and some's outside. Would a great deal of harm be done if, if within reason, a little bit of swapping took place. Then what do you think about C and D? A bigger area now. Is there going to be some limit on the size that you're prepared to swap? Would you swap 50 hectares, for example? No. Where do you stop? And then up the top, that green area, yellow area, there is no land exchanged for that. None. Is it just lost? Given up? No attempt made to exchange, no explanations. It's just been taken over. Now this is the map that was produced by Andrew Surveyors. It's called the Plan of Division for Development and this is the plan I believe that went to the <coughs> Council for approval. We'll show a, an enlargement, make it a bit clearer. The blue line is a contour line of 25 metres. And as I say, you can see it wobbling as the topography of the land changes. It's not in a straight line. <clears throat> the green line is the 20 metre contour. Note, in the middle is lot 43, a reserve of five hectares. After this map was approved, the reserve became lot 45 and was decreased in size to a little bit under four hectares. Now what happened, as the reserve was decreased in size, the area of land that was sold increased in size. Based on what is known, does this map contain data that is contrary to figure four? It sure does. Contrary to principle one? It sure does. Contrary to principle seven? It sure does. Contrary to principle nine? It sure does. Now, did the elected members adequately question whether the plan of division for development that they were shown contained aspects that may have been incompatible with council policy that was in effect at the time? The question is, were they in a position to know? The minutes of the January 2000 council meeting record that a councillor asked why copies of a new development plan currently used by staff had not been made available to elected members. He asked, can I have a look at the development plan? And the development plan contains the principles. The answer was, no, you can't. 
No, you can't. A director said you would need expert tuition to understand it. Was the decision to approve the land division made within a context in which councillors asked for but were denied access to relevant information? Yes. Would an independent and reasonable person consider an informed decision had been made? I'll leave you to answer that one. Now... To come down to worth a bit, we all know that the principles in the development plan may not be hard and fast rules set in concrete. There's always a little bit of variance. But it doesn't mean they should be completely ignored. That's the difference. How could the application have been assessed against provisions, including principles of development control and land division, to which the decision makers had allegedly been denied access? How could they possibly have done it? They didn't know. They didn't know what the principles were. So how would they know whether the map contravened the principles? In addition, evidence has been neither offered nor found showing that at the time of the assessment, council was in possession of a map that defined the extent of the floodplain. Just let that one sink in. Big decisions were made when they didn't know the boundaries of the floodplain. So they didn't know which land was in and which land was out. Although the plan of division for development clearly contained areas shown in yellow that are not consistent with council policy, when they were denied access to the development plan by a director, were councillors also being denied the key to grasping the significance of the information the map contained? That's the crunch. They'll say yes, elective members were all given a copy of the map. But if they didn't understand the map and they didn't know the principles, it would be like giving them a map in Hebrew. Was an informed decision made? Now, this is a composite map that was produced by the Department of Environment, Water and Natural Resources. It's not one of the main four maps studied, but it's been included because it provides a convenient comparison of the effect on the floodplain of the first Tonkin map, which is shown as the white data, and the plan of division for development shown as the, as the yellow da data. It takes a bit of getting your head around, but this is a great map because it shows two different maps on the one map. That makes it a bit clearer. That's an enlargement. Now, the, the red and white dotted line shows the original boundary of allotments and everything inside that red dotted boundary line should be reserved. You can see those yellow lines which are inside the, inside the, the boundary. 
that represents more land that's been lost. This map highlights in white the area of floodplain land that would be sold and thus lost to the community if the white data were to be actioned. This is the least invasive option. You can see there there's a, a little red area representing one hectare, so you can roughly work out how much land is lost. The white land is land lost. But if we switch to the yellow data, which is the map that was approved, suddenly the land loss grows. You've got the white area now, you've got the red area. Both of them now are lost. That adds up to about 10 acres of community land lost just on that one map, but there's more to come. All maps to this stage have shown an approximate one in a hundred year flood line rather than an accurately defined boundary of the floodplain. The Victor Harbour Council advised the then State Governor, Sir Eric Neill, that the 100 ARI flood level, and I quote, will be determined by a hydrological assessment at the time of land division. Still quoting, this requirement, it's their word, not mine, requirement is emphasised in an amended principle seven for the rural living four zone, end of quote. My question is, if there was a requirement who supervised the requirement? Who made sure the requirement was enacted and undertaken? Now we're cooking with gas. This is the first map that is accurate. This is a surveyed proper hydrological assessment. The interesting thing is, it wasn't started until about a fortnight after approval had been given. Do you reckon that could be a case of closing the gate before the horse bolted or after the horse bolted? Now, it's a bit difficult to see, but up the top you'll see a little box, one in a hundred year flood line. It extends the other side of Stock Road. When finally they did a correct map, they were gobsmacked because suddenly they realised the area of the floodplain was a I'm only using this as a colloquial term, about twice the size what they thought it was. They got the shock of their life, but they'd made the decision. This is an, an enlarged portion of the map that I just showed. It shows three lines. The purple line is the one in 10 year flood line. Now, it's not really very important because it's not in the development plan, but it's interesting because we had about a one in 10 year flood two years ago. Some say it was one in 12, some say it was one in 15. It certainly wasn't one in 25, it wasn't one in 50, and it wasn't one in 100. But that'll give you a rough idea of the land that would have been affected by that flood. That's a one in 10 year flood. The blue line is the correct one in hundred line. 
Look how much of Lot 27 is outside that. The red area is the area in the one to ten year zone, if you like, which is accurate. That's how much land would be lost if it were a one in ten year situation. But of course we know that the development plan says one in a hundred, not one in ten. The blue area now represents the 10 to 100. So the red plus blue plus green is the total area that was meant to have been made available to the community. All green of any colour, all green is meant to be reserve. Stated in the development policy that it will be reserve. Now, when you go back to the survey map, that's the area that is meant to be reserved. 30 acres. Think what could have been done with 30 acres of beautiful, pristine, irreplaceable floodplain land. But two thirds of it has been sold off. This is an interesting little piece of paper with Fred Fleming's signature and date. It's the decision of notification and it specifies that the land division involves two lots into 40. Two lots into 40. Remember that number. This is the final, we're on the final stretch. This is the deposited plan that was approved. This is the final plan that was actually approved. Interestingly enough, as the story has progressed and the maps have changed, at every stage, additional reserve has been lost. Every change of map involves additional reserve being lost. Nick's with us now. He might be interested to see this. Lot 28 on the original first Tonkin map was 1.7 hectares in size. This changed on the next map, the plan of division, and became lot 29 of 1.2 hectares plus an additional lot 30 of 1.2 hectares. They made two blocks out of one. This happened after it had been approved. What was the process and authorisation by which the reserve was reduced from five hectares as shown on the plan of division for development that was approved by council and it became a little bit under four hectares, 3.99, as shown on the deposited plan? You'll also note that the reserve on that map is lot 45. But the notification said two lots into 40. What's, I don't understand what's happened. Has five additional lots been made up somehow along the line? Who authorised that? How did that happen?
this simply sets out the four different maps and the varying size as they were each produced, referring back to lot 28 and 29. It started out at 1.7 hectares. Then the next version was the plan of division and it became 2.4 hectares. Then map 999254, the survey map, 2.45 hectares. And lo and behold, the final map that was approved, it was 2.755 hectares. And at the same time, the area of land for sale increased by 1.055 hectares. The size of the reserve decreased by 1.055. 0.09 hectares. It's always good to have a few points to ponder. How could the community shareholders in the organisation that's responsible for acting in our best interests be more aware of and actively engaged concerning the processes undertaken and the decisions made on our behalf? I think we need to be more active. Have the processes undertaken concerning the Crozier Hill land divisions been consistent with and reflective of the standards of professional practice that the community consider to be acceptable? How could an informed assessment have been undertaken of the development application and approval given for the land division when the decision makers allegedly did not have access to all relevant and necessary information, including the basic information that defined the extent of the floodplain. Just because court action may be the only route by which a decision of council and remember this was acted on more than 15 years ago, can be legally set aside, that does not necessarily mean the decision was made by well-informed councillors, was consistent with council policy, was undertaken via a sound and appropriate process, was in the best interests of the community, and the environment was understood and supported by the majority of the community and or was ethically acceptable. Now we started out looking at four maps and seeing whether any of them at any stage complied. I can tell you that evidence has not been found that any of the relevant maps depicted in the series of stages have at any time been consistent with figure four and been consistent with the specific principles of land division seven and nine in the rural living four zone. Perhaps the development plan may not have the authority of a legal or compulsory ruling, but that doesn't mean it can be ignored completely. Council was required to assess both of the Crozier Hill development applications against all of the relevant provisions at the time of lodgement. Evidence shows that such a course of action could not have been undertaken and I believe was not undertaken. We're aware there is a dispute involving two or three locals over issues that have been determined by a court of law and various decisions of council that nothing untoward has occurred. However, 
Issues raised within this report have not been before a court of law, may become a strong community issue in addition to being a council issue. Yes, it may concern two or three locals, plus thousands of voters at the forthcoming council elections. This is no longer the exclusive domain of council. This is now a community issue. The cork's out of the champagne bottle, if you like. The genie's out. After the current review is finished and presented, perhaps a majority decision of council may be that all necessary steps were properly taken and all the little boxes were neatly ticked. That there is no case to answer as no one has done anything wrong. And even if they had, nothing can be done about it. Irrespective of any such decision being made, there could be many people who are very annoyed and unable to understand why about 20 acres of unique floodplain land has been lost to our community because it has been subdivided and sold for private profit. Thank you. Coast Television, your community, your voice.